So I forgot a disclosure slide, but I'll just tell you, I get royalties from Prager Publishers for a book called Kids Sports and Concussion, and from Up to Date for writing chapters about sport-related concussion and chronic exertional compartment syndrome. Um, for the orthopedists in the room, at the top of the spinal column is a gelatinous organ called the brain, which is fairly insignificant, but ultimately has an effect on the mobility of the muscles and the joints. And there have been case reports in, um, I'm loud, is it too loud if, I, if I'm near the microphone, no? All right. Um, there have been case reports of players in sports that involve collisions often impacting the head who later in life have had problems with their memory, uh, often getting frank dementia, they've had problems controlling their mood, difficulty concentrating, um, and, and really sort of dropped out of society, started abusing substances, et cetera. And at autopsy, these athletes were found to have abnormal proteins deposited in the brain called tau, which is associated with other neurodegenerative problems as well. And it led to the hypothesis that maybe during their sports they sustained concussions that led to this tau and that the tau somehow is responsible for the difficulties with cognition and their neuro neurological symptoms. And that led to a call to ban sports. The medical director of some scholastic league in New Hampshire wants to ban high school football. People all over the country want to ban football and ice hockey, ban heading and soccer. And we got to thinking about it, some of our, my colleagues who I'll show you at the end here. And I think, A, there's a lot to be proven, but B, these professional athletes have long exposures to collision sports, right? So if you're the average kid who's gonna play high school and then that's it, I don't know that you're at the same amount of risk. Furthermore, the intensity of those exposures is much, much greater, right? These are guys who had Pop Warner, they played at some big high school typically, then they went to like Texas A&M or Michigan or BC or someplace with a lot of big guys colliding with each other. I don't know that that exposure is the same. And so we set out to test the hypothesis that exposure to collision sports is associated with increased neurobehavioral symptoms later in life, typically people in their 40s and 50s. Um, we did a cross-sectional study of alumni from the New England Small College Athletic Conference. So yes, these alumni participated in college sports. Very few people from NESCAC go on to play professionally, and furthermore, they are not of the size and power and sort of generating uh, force as the Texas A&M and Michigan and Boston College and places like that. And so we purposely picked people who had a sport that might be typical for athletes in general society in both duration and exposure. Uh, we questioned them, we sent them a link to a questionnaire and we asked them what sports, if any, they participated in college and how many seasons. And then we compared that exposure to neurobehavioral assessments developed by the CDC and the NIH. Um, these are probably the most validated assessments of neurobehavioral symptoms in the world. It was a very large process that they underwent to develop these, but you can access them now for free online, and this is just a small segment of one of them. To give you an idea, these athletes agreed to sit at a computer for 40 minutes and fill out multiple assessments of their cognition, their mood, their ability to control their behavior, substance abuse, et cetera, and we were able to correlate their exposure to sports with their findings. Um, we needed a reference group, so our, our hypothesis was that subconcussive blows had some effect on neurobehavioral symptoms. We needed a comparison group. We chose non-contact sport athletes, so um, collision sports are sports where intentional, purposeful blows to the body are delivered as a part of the game. Ice hockey for men, uh, football, rugby for both sexes, men's lacrosse. A uh, contact sport, which we did not choose as a referent, would be things where incidental blows to the body occur, but you can't purposefully do it. So soccer, basketball, where there are body-to-body -body sort of bumps during the game, but you can't purposely go knock a guy over, would be a contact sport. Non-contact would be things where even that doesn't occur, so tennis, cross-country, swimming, things like that. And finally, non-athletes. And of all those populations, um, I believe there are differences between athletes and non-athletes in their overall health, the way they exercise, their self-confidence, and likely those things affect their neurobehavioral symptom level. So we didn't choose non-athletes. We chose non-contact sport athletes as our referent group. We were able to adjust then for potential confounders, highest level of academic degree they obtain, the amount of money they make, uh, other comorbidities, hypertension and stroke and obesity, and even current, their current exercise habits. Now, there's a lot on this slide. 
I just want to focus in on something that's going to be important. Um, these are alumni who are 40 to 70 years old who went to a college in the New England Small College Athletic Conference. Those are schools like Colby and Bates and Williams and Amherst. Um, so in general, they're white, right? So, so way back then, the white people were predominantly making up college graduates from those colleges. Could still be true today, I don't know. Um, and they make a lot of money. 70% of them made over $100,000 a year. So I don't know that you could just go and generalize this to everybody, but for people who graduate from one of these colleges, th th that certainly would, um, our conclusions would apply to. Now, there is another factor. So if you play a collision sport, you're more likely to have suffered a concussion than if you played a non-contact sport. And it's already well established that if you suffer multiple concussions, there can be a cumulative effect that um, is associated with long-term neurobehavioral sequelae. So first of all, we had to find out who had concussions. Um, the linear regression produces something called a beta coefficient, which is essentially the effect of your exposure on one of the outcomes. So a negative beta coefficient means you had worse performance in there, a positive one means better performance. And I'll just summarize this by saying all the people who had a concussion in their past performed worse on every measure. If the measure itself is negative, they got a higher score. If the measure is positive, they got a lower score. And that was a significant finding. Now, A, that wasn't our hypothesis. B, I don't read too much into that because this is subject to recall bias. If you are now in your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, having many neurobehavioral symptoms, you're more likely to remember having sustained a concussion sometime in the past than if you don't, right? Even if you both had a concussion, the guy doing well, less likely to recall it. And so I don't read too much into this, quite frankly. What we did then was removed all these people. We said, if you have a concussion in your past, we're gonna take you out of the data set entirely and just compare people with no history of concussion who are exposed to collision sports or who participated in non-contact sports. And when we did that, the effect resolved in almost every category. The one thing I will say, Participants in collision sports drank alcohol slightly more frequently than those who participated in non-contact sports. <laughs> now, I will just tell you, when I was a freshman at Boston College playing rugby, we drank more than the tennis team. I mean, I don't, I don't, <laughs> think, I don't think that necessarily resulted from our exposure. I think we come in that way, right? You're more likely to play rugby and to drink beer than you can play tennis, and I, but, but I can't say that for sure. Um, now, we had some limitations. So we could not contact the alumni directly. The schools who agreed to participate said, we will send them one email only to the address we have on file, no reminders, no ability to explain or answer questions. And I think as a result of that, we got a relatively low response rate, about 8%. It's still over 300 alumni that participated. Um, and as I mentioned, with regards to whether or not they had a concussion, I do believe that's subject to recall bias, but again, not our hypothesis. Uh, so our conclusions were that athletes exposed to collision sports, at least at a lower level of intensity and with shorter periods of exposure than modern day professional athletes, um, there was no significant associations between that exposure and their later life neurobehavioral symptoms. Um, we have launched two similar studies now. So as was mentioned earlier, the Football Players Health Study at Harvard, which is funded in part by the National Football League Players Association, is doing a similar study using similar measures on all former NFL players. Um, and the McKaley Center for Sports Injury Prevention has now launched a prospective cohort study of athletes currently at Harvard, where we're getting a ton of data, including EEGs and balance assessments and MR spectroscopy, et cetera, and we're going to follow them over time. Actually, David Howell, one of our postdocs in the back of the room, is running that for us. Um, I want to just acknowledge my collaborators, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Dennis, any comment? Uh, thank you. I don't know if any, I have any specific questions, but when you come to Harvard, you get outdone. Martha in speed of speech, <laughs> and uh, Dr. Me in, in intensity of delivery. <laughs> Very well done. Um, there's a lot of money in concussion research now. And it's not entirely clear what news the money givers want to hear. I think you have to be really careful in this research. As I said, in Iowa, all studies needed to, all research studies in the end, you knew before you started them with your staff what the answer was supposed to be. 
In Toronto right now, it's pretty clear. Surgeons are salaried at the hospital for sick children. And they get a lot of money for research. And the more they say that most diseases do pretty well without expensive treatment, the happier the government is. It's billions of dollars. Concussions, uh, I think it is important. I don't think we're willing to change our American sort of sports risk profile. If we were, we would outlaw professional boxing. There's no doubt about it. But then you talk with Tim Ward, who was on the Boxing Commission for Pennsylvania for a while about the possible outcomes for this group and how having aspirations to be a professional boxer. In Southern California, the Hispanics are hugely in it. And we allow it. You know, you wear the little helmets for the golden gloves sort of thing, but eventually you graduate to um, allowing your head to be battered. And we don't think that that is wrong. So it gets into this risk homeostasis. Humans want a risky life. And there's a lot of research money with it. I think you sort of go along on the ride, but I'm not quite sure where we're going. Yeah, I just want to comment on the funding a little bit. Um, there's a, a, a lot of research funding maybe on the foundation side. The actual NIH, the levels they dedicate to pediatric brain trauma, not even just concussion, but all brain trauma, is the same amount of money they give to Agent Orange. So we really don't have a lot of concussion. It's like 0.01% of their overall budget. Um, the foundations are starting to give money, but that's much smaller money than government funding. Um, but you're right that the, the funding agencies often have their own agenda. And so it was very important for us to separate what we're doing from the funding sources. Anyway, thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, Bill, I just have a question. At the present time, with all the recognition of concussion as a major problem, kids play sports, and they get hit in the head, they get a little bit of a headache, they've never been knocked out. Yeah. What happens to those people? I mean, do you see yeah. them? When you see them, what do you do with them? Yeah. Who gets yeah. tested? Who doesn't at the present yeah. time? What's yeah. the modern? Just tell us what the deal is. Yeah, that's great. Actually, it's a little easier question than what I thought you were going to say. So now, if they get hit in the head, they have a headache, uh, they get removed from sports, ultimately they can't go back to their cleared by a medical professional. Most medical professionals at that point would say, look, I'm not positive was it a concussion or not, but we're going to err on the side of safety. And they will gradually return them to all their schoolwork, gradually return them to athletics, but avoid contact for the first several days. If that goes okay, they participate in full practice and then ultimately full participation in sports just to be safe, I think. The, um, as far as who gets tested, so there's several different types of tests. There's a test of balance that we do before the season starts in athletes uh, so that we get them before they're injured. Most schools that have an athletic trainer will do that. Uh, there are symptom inventories that they do and some other small cognitive tests that you can do without a lot of tools, and most schools that have an athletic trainer will get that. And then there's computerized neurocognitive tests, which are much more sensitive and can measure your reaction time to one one thousandth of a second. And um, a lot of the schools, about 50% of high schools that have an athletic trainer will get that. A much higher percentage of colleges will get that. Um, but just to put it in perspective, the entire public school system for the city of Boston has one athletic trainer who really sets policy and stuff, but is not in, there's no training room, there's, they're not on the sidelines. And so um, we're really talking about rich kids getting the services, quite frankly. Thank you. Thanks, Bill.